In Yu-Gi-Oh, there are a lot of cards with lore surrounding them or that appear in the anime. And in this video, we'll go over the best cards in the game that just also happen to have stories and lore associated to them. And starting off at number 10, we have Retort. This is a counter trap card that occasionally sees play in the side deck of meta decks because it's an excellent counter to mirror matches as it allows you to negate the effect and destroy a spell or trap card that you have in your graveyard and then add a copy of that card back to your hand after you negate your opponents. So it's a negate that allows you to go plus one but it's also incredibly situational and why it's only at the number 10 spot on this list. Now, Retort is surprisingly the end of the storyline about a king who went on a tirade. The story is told through a whole bunch of cards, but the gist of it is the king started to oppress people, went on a tirade and just kind of threw a fit, abusing his subjects and soldiers, and then the oppressed people eventually started a huge revolution, which failed due to double agents in the crowd. But the soldiers revolted as well. And then he was eventually demoted by the king from Imperial Order, which I guess was a higher level king than him or something. And then after he was deposed, he walks the street, having stuff thrown at him by his previous subjects, which is where the artwork of Retort comes in. And at number 9, we have Where Arf Thou? This is a spell card that allows you to search out any level 1 monster from your deck if you control a level 1 monster. This card is used extensively in modern Spyro decks, as they play 3 level 1 monsters pretty heavily, and we'll probably see more play in the future if people adopt the Magician Souls engine. In the artwork for Where Art Thou, it shows a boy putting up posters for his lost dog, and you can see the dog in the background, who is actually the outstanding dog Moran. Although, the boy never actually finds his lost dog, and the dog waited so long that three different possible outcomes happened to him, based on three different cards. First is that he got lost in the dark world and became the Mad Dog of Darkness. Second is that he got converted into a machine and became the Mecha Dog Moran. And third is that he died after waiting for 1000 years and became the Skull Dog Moran. Now, unfortunately, of these three possible outcomes, it's most likely that Skull Dog Moran is the canon ending, as we'll talk about that a little bit more in a different spot in this video. And at number eight, we have Wavering Eyes. This is a quick play spell card which destroys all cards in the pendulum zones and then gains an effect based on the amount of cards destroyed. This card was so good during the pendulum era that it actually got banned for a while as it allowed you to destroy your opponent's scales while also gaining advantage. As if you destroyed four cards, you got to add another copy of this card from your deck to your hand, you got to banish a card on the field, you got to search out any pendulum monster from your deck, and you got to inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent. So it was a possible 4 card destruction, which lets you go plus 2 in card advantage while also setting up your extra deck. Although, nowadays with pendulums being pretty heavily nerfed, it's no longer banned and hardly sees any competitive play. Now, the artwork on this card is the middle in a story involving two characters, called Sam Bell the Summoner and her older brother, Rise Bell the Summoner. In the background of Rise Bell the Summoner, you can see the Hypno Sister and her familiar, Trans Familiar. In the artwork of Wavering Eyes, you can see them jump Rise Bell and corrupt him, turning him into Rise Bell the Star Adjuster. Then she goes even further beyond and transforms him into Rise Bell the Star Psyker. But then, through the power of friendship or an unwavering bond, his sister is able to undo his corruption and presumably bring him back to normal as Unwavering Bond is the last card in the storyline. And at number 7, we have Mistake. This is a very simple Floodgate card that, while it's on the field, neither player can add cards from their deck to their hand except by drawing them. And since one of the requirements for a deck to be good is to basically have a whole bunch of search materials, this card does an excellent job at shutting down pretty much every single good deck. And just like all the other cards so far, this good card, which sees competitive play, also tells a little short story. In the story, you can see the card Sangan getting onto the wrong bus. He was trying to take a tour bus to the underworld, which he had taken in the past as you can see him in one of the windows of the bus, and instead accidentally took a ride to the Forbidden Realms. As in the artwork Tour Bus to the Forbidden Realms, you can see Sangan sitting next to the monsters from Tribe Infection Virus, along with a couple of other banned cards in the background or all these cards were banned when this card came out anyway. 
as The Forbidden Realms is an obvious play on words for The Forbidden List, cards that are banned from the current format and not allowed to be played in your deck. Eventually, Sangen gets off the bus and hops into a car with banned spell cards, as it's being driven by one of the imps from Delinquent Duo, and he's being comforted by the angel from Graceful Charity. Although this car gets pulled over and everyone gets arrested as they had a pot of greed in the trunk. He's then placed in jail alongside the Witch of the Black Force, who was another banned car that has an incredibly similar effect to Sangan, where they both allow you to search monsters from your deck after they're destroyed. Eventually though, Sangan and Witch of the Black Force had their effects changed and then they were released from the ban list, although there isn't a card showing this. The best we get is Summon Gate, which shows Thousand Eyes Restrict getting released from the extra deck ban list. So we can just assume Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest eventually got out in the same way that Thousand Eyes Restrict did. And at number six, we have There Can Be Only One. This is a continuous trap card which locks both players from having more than two types of monsters on the field. So if you're playing against a deck that has nothing but zombies or machine types, for example, they're only allowed to play one monster of those types each and it's a really good floodgate card against a lot of decks, since lots of decks play cards of the exact same type. And in fact, it's one of the more heavily played floodgates in the game currently. And this card also continues the story of Outstanding Dog Moran. You see, after turning into a skeleton, the dog was adopted by the Skull Servant family, as you can see them in the artwork of White Princess and White Prince, taking him on a walk and Monster Rebone, with him running away from Skull Servant. Then in the artwork of There Can Only Be One, the Skull Servant family is going on vacation when they get stopped. And then in the artwork of Quarantine, you can see that the dog has been quarantined off. And uh, that's about it. The story ends here. Although since Skull Servant is a king now, he doesn't have much to worry about and he'd most likely get his dog back and go on vacation like planned. And at number five, we have Skill Drain. This is a powerful floodgate card which just negates the effects of all monsters in the field, and can win you the game against a lot of decks, which is why it's currently limited to one copy, because it's a little bit too easy to use for how good of an effect it has. And Skill Drain is showing the battle which takes place between Dark Ruler Hades and this random level 3 vanilla monster called Dark King of the Abyss. You see, the Dark King got demoted by the Dark Ruler, as shown in the card Demotion, so he set up an elaborate ruse in order to get back at him. As shown in the card Hatebuster, he gives him some kind of device which drains his power, as shown in Skill Drain. And then over the course of three cards, you see him stealing the Dark Ruler's soul. But then the Dark Ruler is revived thanks to the Plague Spreader zombie virus, and comes back and destroys the Dark King of the Abyss. But then what do you know, Dark King of the Abyss also revives, as shown in Powerful Rebirth and Reject Reborn, and then uses the soul he captured in order to blast the revived King Hades with the Kamehameha Wave, only to be immediately instigibbed by the Archfiend Emperor, the first Lord of Horror, as shown in the card Call of the Archfiend. Or something like that. Honestly, with a lot of these card artworks lore, you kind of just have to put these pieces together for yourself and figure things out. And at number 4, we have Solemn Strike. This is one of the top 10 most played trap cards in the game, as at the measly cost of 1500 life points, you get a spell speed 3 card which can negate a monster effect and destroy that card, or negate a special summon and destroy the card. Both of these happen in pretty much every deck, so this card is almost always live and has an excellent effect. Now, as for the story of this card, there was a maiden who just got her hands on a whole bunch of forbidden items and then got a scolding from the guy from Solemn Judgment. Although after her scolding, she decided to keep on going after forbidden stuff and steals the forbidden scriptures. Although in the bottom left of the card artwork, you can see that the guy from Solemn Judgment catches her in the act. And that's where Solemn Strike comes into play as he strikes her down with whatever divine power he has. So then she becomes the Condemned Maiden and then gets an upgrade into the Condemned Witch and tries to go back and fight in Witch's Strike and is able to strike down the Bearded Fellow, becoming the Condemned Dark Lord, gaining a halo afterwards, which we can assume means she gained his power somewhat. With Condemned Dark Lord being the last card in this series of stories, it seems as if the story will probably continue in the future, but this is where it ends for now. And at number three, we have Orcus Crescendo. 
This was the Omni Negate counter trap for the Orcus archetype, which saw heavy play because Orcus decks were one of the most played decks in the past year. And what it did was allow you to negate the effect of a card if you controlled an Orcus Link monster, and it had a graveyard effect to add a dark machine monster from your deck or banner zone to your hand. So it was a really good counter trap, and the lore this card depicts is part of the world legacy lore, and is kind of the culmination of one of the last parts of it. And the world legacy lore is super long. So I'm going to summarize the hell out of it to explain exactly what's going on in here. World legacy lore starts off with a post-apocalyptic world that's overrun by mech knights. In a small remote village, there were three friends and their pet dragon. Avram, who was chosen to save the world, Ib and Ningursu, who are brother and sister, and Imduk, the baby dragon, who follows their group around. One day, the fairy named Lee comes and finds the group and tells them that they are the chosen ones who are meant to find the seven world legacy artifacts, which would help them save the world, and then leads them to the World Chalice. World Chalice then upgrades all of them into more powerful forms, and they head out to find the other world legacy items. Eventually, they come across the world armor, which is overrun by crawlers. During the fight with the crawlers, Ib is captured by the mech knights, so the remaining three chase after her and find them at the world shield. So the three fight the mech knights while the fairy Lee goes off to rescue Ib. And then, plot twist, turns out Lee was actually evil, and finds Ib and uses the world chalice in order to fuse themselves together in order to become nightmare corruptor Ibli. Ibli then joins the fray and completely destroys all of the mech knights and transforms them into the nightmares. But she's not able to get all of them, as mech knight Blue Sky hands off his power source to Avram before he's killed, which transforms him into mech knight Avram. Ningursu then tells mech knight Avram to go save his sister while he'll stay behind to fight the remaining six nightmares by himself. Two of which are banned, mind you, and two of the others are some of the most played cards in the game, so, you know pretty tough accomplishment here. Although Avram is not actually able to defeat Ibli, and right before he's about to be finished off, the dragon Imduk appears and is able to temporarily stop her, by forcing Ib's spirit out of Ibli's fused body. Ib is then able to kill herself with her ghost body in order to stop Lee, and then this is when Ningursu returns, having defeated the six nightmares by himself, which is pretty impressive considering he's a vanilla monster in this form as his powers were stripped from him when Lee betrayed them, he's shocked to find the body of his dead sister. And then this ends the first chapter of the story, and is when the group parts ways. We're almost to the part with Orcus Crescendo. Ningursu then takes Ib's body to the research lab, which was used to create the Mech Knights, and Avram goes off and finds the Crusadia tribe. While on their journeys, Avram is able to also find the World Crown, while Ningursu is able to find the location of the World Wand and Spear. Avram uses the World Crown in order to transform the Crusadia tribe into stronger forms, as well as randomly one crawler. And Ningursi uses the World Wand in order to power the orchestrated Babel, as well as upgrading himself to the Orcist Orchestrator, then turns his sister's corpse into a robot, known as Galatea. Avram and his group of Crusadia go to the tower in order to stop this new person who is building a new line of evil machines. During the battle, the tower exploded, and with six of the World Legacy items coming together for the first time, it spawned the seventh World Legacy item, the World Arc. And with all seven of the World Legacy items combined, they transformed into the Guard Dragons. While all this is happening, Ningursu and Avrim are fighting, and Galatea, who was most likely being controlled by the Spirit of Lee at this point, absorbs the remaining power of the Tower of Babel and transforms into Orcus Nightmare. As the Orca's nightmare, she joined the battle and kills Imduk, who dies trying to protect Avram. Then she goes out and absorbs the power of three of the guard dragons, and transforms into nightmare incarnation Eadli. She then summons the ultimate crawler monster, and world legacy guard dragon Mardark. Then they all have one final mega battle, where Imduk's soul combines with some of the remaining guard dragons in order to create guard dragon Almarduk and Ningursu hops onto a metal horse and becomes Dingursu, the Orcist of the Evening Star. And then this is where Orcus Crusendo comes in. Dingursu, after a long battle presumably, trying to stop his rampaging sister, throws his lance at her and manages to beat her. 
in which case her soul is ripped from her body by a guard dragon, and then she's reincarnated. But that's not the end of the World Chalice story, as after all of this is done and settled, a gigantic Death Star machine comes to the planet from space, and they give all of their powers to Avram so that he can fly into space to fight this machine, where he presumably dies in the battle after a whole bunch of other stuff happens, and leaves the world key to Ib to protect the world from future threats, with Ib becoming Lib, the world key master, wearing the cloak from Ningursu and the scarf from Avram, and then Ningursu going off on his own as Mech Knight Orcus Gursu, which is where the world legacy story ends. For now, they might add more to it in the future, but just know I super skimmed over a lot of the story and there is no official canon series of events, so a lot of these scenes and parts are up for interpretation. And at number two, we have Evenly Matched. Evenly Matched is the most played trap card in the game currently, and is a huge part in why going second decks are viable strategy now, in a game where going first usually gave the best advantage, as this card allows you to activate it from your hand at the end of the battle phase, if you control no cards, and has the effect where your opponent must banish their own cards face down so that they control the same number of cards as you. So, if you meet the conditions to activate this card from your hand, your opponent will have to banish all but one of their cards, which is basically a full board wipe, with one of the best types of removal, non-targeting, banishing face down, with an action controlled by your opponent. And now, the lore for this card kind of has a long history, like World Legacy lore, so it has to do with Six Samurai lore, although luckily in the Six Samurai lore universe, they have a time skip, so I'll just start there. The story starts off in the card Standoff, where it has Shadow of the Six Samurai Shien challenging the Great Shogun Shien to a battle, as Shadow of the Six Samurai is the only Six Samurai in the game who is both a Six Samurai and a Shien card, and it's heavily implied that he used to be the body double for the Great Shogun, and is probably challenging him for the Shogun's power, although in the corner there is Hand of the Six Samurai waiting to attack the Great Shogun as well. And in the card face-off, you can see that the Great Shogun notices her and stops her before she gets a chance to backstab him, and then in the card evenly matched, you see them actually fighting one another, and since both cards have the exact same attack power at 2500, they're evenly matched, and we don't really know the outcome of this battle, but one can assume that at least the Great Shogun Shien died, as the card Legendary Secret of the Six Samurai was released afterwards, which is his armor with a ghost inhabiting it. And we don't really have any confirmation on Shadow of the Six Samurai, who could have died as well, or maybe one in the battle, who knows. And at number one, we have Return from the Different Dimension. This card has the effect where you can pay half your life points to special summon as many of your banished monsters as possible but they get banished during the end phase, which doesn't matter because this card is actually just special summon five monsters, which is super good effect and why this card is currently banned. And what do you know? This card is the end of a story for another card called the DD Warrior Lady. The story starts off with the Warrior Lady of the Wasteland fighting the Warrior Digrepher, and then during the fight she gets pulled into the different dimension, which in Yu-Gi-Oh lore is what we refer to as the Banish Zone. While in the different dimension, you can see her being recruited with three other different dimension warriors in DD Recruits. And she's also a DD Designator, whatever that means. Anyways, also in the different dimension is Warrior Digrepher, who goes through all kinds of changes in the different dimension, and there's even a card which depicts the two different versions of the Warrior Digrepher meeting in the different dimension. And Warrior Digrepher and DD Warrior Lady have another fight, and at one point he tries to seduce her, and then she fights another version of him, probably indicating that she has been successful in all of the fights against him. And then eventually she finds the Different Dimension Gate, and is able to go home as shown in the card Return from the Different Dimension, along with four other monsters, one of them also being a Different Dimension Warrior. Now, there's lots of cards which depict events happening in the Different Dimension, and DD Warrior Lady is just one of its many inhabitants. And it just so happens that two of the cards depicting events from the different dimension are currently banned, with the other one being Dimension Fusion, which probably shows the early stages of return from the different dimension before they actually break free. Alright, and that's the end of the video. On this one I made sure to pick cards which were actually good in the real game, 
and just happened to show card lore in them as well. I wasn't rating them based on how much lore they had or if it was even good. So if you have any ideas for videos similar to this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments. And did you know, only 29.7% of people who watch my videos are subscribed to the channel?